Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Thursday the 19th of August 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we tackle Chapter 5, The Libertarian Communism. I've been on holidays for the last week or so, so I've been taking a little downtime from the normal hectic release schedule. Safe to say things will be back to normal in a week or so. If you like extra bonus episodes, creating Discord over on the Discord server, joining in the Patreon reading group series, or just want to help me out, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Okay, let's join the session. Okay, welcome to the sixth session of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group series. This week we tackle Chapter 5, The Libertarian Communism. So we're going to be attacking, not we, the GIC and Jan Appel are going to be taking on the anarchist and the anarcho-syndicalist types in this chapter. Before we start, I had a little look last week. We were mentioning um, Grossman's accumulation capital and the breakdown of capitalist production or whatever the hell the name of it is. And I went and I looked for all the places where he was talking about Hilferding and giving a critique of Hilferding. And it wasn't so much along the lines of the critique that's in this book. There was two major kind of critiques. So one of them was the idea of the cartel. And you mentioned like Rockefellers that pay a profit to nobody. Um, So this idea of the cartels eliminating commercial profit. That was kind of one bit where he was talking about. And then the second bit of note was this idea of finance capital being the dominant sector that would be in control, essentially, of industry through their credit creation. But actually, what we've kind of seen is is the opposite under the development under capitalism, whereby the industrialists actually had access to their they managed to get access towards their own capital or launch their own bonds themselves. So that when we see today, if you look at credit creation by the banking sector towards production in the developed world is actually very small. So that was one prediction by the you know, Hilferding and the finance capital kind of cartel vision of where things would go that was kind of incorrect. But they didn't take him on on their value theory grounds so much from that book, from the 10 or 12 passages where Hilferding was mentioned. But I'd like to read that, reread re- that book now, to be honest with you, after reading this. But anyway, so I think we're going to start here from A, Occupied Enterprises Take As Needed. And we're going to get into what the GIC think about the political economy of the anarchist left, as opposed to the Bolshevik social democrats, who we've been essentially taking to task for the last few chapters. Uh, anybody got want to put a hand up there and see if they can if they want to do a bit of reading here, Chris? Okay, libertarian communism. A. Occupy the enterprises. Take as needed. It is sad to note, but it is hardly worth the effort to look at the different factions within the labor movement in terms of their views on communist operational life. It is an infertile wasteland of uniformity. In all currents, we find the same economic principles, which are represented only in different phrases. Social democracy, Bolshevism, syndicalism, the cross between Marxism and syndicalism, which we call guild socialism, anarchism, it's all from one mold. If we leave the social democratic workers movement for the time being to look more closely at libertarian communism, syndicalism and anarchism, The federalist structure of this movement immediately catches the eye. From this, it can be directly deduced that the communist economy is also understood here as a federated, rather a federal summary of producers and consumers. This direction is therefore strongly directed against the state, while self-management is one of its characteristic features. Although there is no well-founded economic theory of libertarian communism, The general way of thinking that exists among the workers can be summarized briefly. Basically, the theory does not go beyond the slogan, the enterprises to the workers. The reciprocal relationship 
between the companies is regulated by the free agreement. And what the relationship between the producers and social product will look like, we hear the vaguest rumors about that. It is partly assumed that enterprises will become productive associations in which the workers will then distribute the proceeds of labor. And part of the idea is that enterprises through the uh, free agreement will enter into a direct trade in goods and simply deliver their product to the place where it is requested without charging. Another characteristic of libertarian communism is that it often manages to solve the question of individual consumption quite simply with the formula, everyone takes according to his needs. Although libertarian communism seems quite close to the Marxist association of free and equal producers, due to the demand for self-government, this is by no means the case. In this camp, there is no idea what free producers and equal producers are. In libertarian communism, the slogan, the enterprises to the workers, has the meaning that the workers regard the enterprises as their property which they can arbitrarily dispose of. In the Marxist sense, however, the new legal relationship is that the operations belong to the community. Machines and raw materials are social goods controlled by the workers and entrusted to the workers responsible for production management. This directly means that the community must also have control over the proper management of its products. However, Libertarian communism firmly rejects such control, since the workers are then again no bosses in their own house. We also find this ideological contradiction in the free agreement. Communism does not know this category. It only knows equal producers. Equal because they have to run their business according to general binding rules. Only on this basis can they make connections with other companies. The so-called free agreement contradicts any general applicable social regulation and is therefore anti-communist. Okay, mic drop. <laughs> yeah, so there's quite, a, quite a, a lot here. Let's have a look. So he says here, although libertarian communism seems quite close to the Marxist association of free and equal producers due to the demand for self-government, this is by no means the case. Well, I think this is true. Like, I think if we look at the, uh, well, let's just take the idea of the kind of libertarian communism or, or anarch anarchism, I think it is closest to the general gist of what Marx and Engels had when they talked about free and equal producers. So I think that's a real bow in the, uh, what's that expression? I don't even know what the expression is, bow in the bonnet for anarchism and libertarian communism. I think they have a core essence of what we should be looking for correct, but they don't have a political economy underlining this. They, there isn't a, a, like general rules. I think like this idea as well of simply saying at the start, everyone takes according to his knees is how they manage consumption. You know, like it, that seems, and I think this is quite universal on say the left communist side of things that they want this immediate switch from, say, a capitalist-like distribution to just add a, a full communism straight away. And I, I think that is a problem. I think that is denying the fundamental way that societies evolve out of one into the other, that they are, you know, I, I think it's quite uh, utopian, that, that view Okay, and also then the, he, he gets to this kind of key concept, which we mentioned last week, he hinted at, which is that the enterprises to the workers has the meaning that the workers regard the enterprises as their property, which they can arbitrarily dispose of. You know, So this is something that this book is going to go square up against. Okay, anybody have any comments here? Let me see, there's somebody in the chat. Uh, be in the bonnet, that's it, Chris. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, any comments here? Hands up about this section donald well all i was going to say was how did they defend this proposition like anarchists because i can't imagine that that this is a real position that anyone holds maybe i'm missing something i don't know 
I think this is exactly the position that people that are like anarchist or left comms hold that there will be like a bargaining between the different sectors, you know, like these workers are the miners. These are these other guys over here. They have agreements to send this amount of metal to these guys and get this amount of goods back. And it's like there are free agreements between all these workers that are abstracted away from value relations. Like, I think that's actually what they think. And I think then that consumption, maybe not initially, as we'll see in the chapter, maybe not initially, it's it's not based on each according to their needs, but like that soon it would be according to their needs. And initially there would probably be some, as we will see later in the chapter, the Statistics Bureau, the equivalent of the Social Democrat or the, the Bolshevik idea of having people above society, whether it's the union or the party, Union for the Syndicalists, the party for the Bolsheviks, deciding what these statistics, your consumption behaviors should be. But that's what it devolves in. That's what they're going to make the case for, that the anarchist position without having the political economy to ground their kind of correct interpretation about the free, like the generally more correct interpretation of the free and equal producers. They don't have the political economy, so it kind of collapses into the the same as the others. Okay, Slavic would like to speak. Yeah, so I can speak from like some of the anarchists I knew that when it was kind of discussed, you know, okay, how do we how would one actually deal with the enterprise ownership not just not just being owned by the workers but the community as well, you know, cuz obviously they talk about workers owning the enterprises. It's kind of it's mostly just left kind of vague like there is some recognition like, oh, yeah, the community should have some control over this. But like you said, Tom, because it, there's like not really an economic articulation of how that would be achieved. It's just kind of like you said, it kind of devolves into right, like an attempt to kind of trade in kind. And we see how that has resulted in other systems. Yeah, I I think in like the participatory economic of Michael Alberts and Robert Hamill, they go towards, you know, different types of councils. So there might be consumer councils having votes over distribution and production as well as just the workers. But their their solution, I'm pretty certain, doesn't use labor time accounting. So I think that would be like maybe some of the best kind of, you would say, anarcho-syndicalist or an anarchist type planning schemes out there, but they don't do the labor time planning. Any other comments here? Uh, Simon? I just want to say that in my interactions with anarchists, I've often found a quite a autarkic primitivist streak, so that there's a sense that it, you're almost returning back to a kind of hunter-gatherer pooling of resources and that uh, because an anarchist set up communities would be brought down to a smaller kind of scale of say 50 people who can uh, agree on a person to person basis how to share the resources and that you'd keep interactions with other communities to a minimum I think that's where a lot of the potential problems would be explained away yeah like there's there's a definite trend of anarcho-primitism that is fairly, I think, pretty common amongst anarchists. I'm not going to say it's the dominant trend, but it's definitely there. Like, there doesn't seem to be an equivalent, uh, like, anarcho communist uh, what would you call it, primitivist communist to the same extent. But uh, who knows why that is. Uh, Herman? Yes, and I think in addition, when they talk about every one takes according to his needs, and they always have uh, the consumption only in mind. So they, they see the product and they, they talk about planning in kind, but they neglect uh, the labor which is connected to this. Because if, if I say everyone takes according to his needs, then the need is not only the product or the consumption, but is the relation to the necessary labor as well. And I think they neglect always the, the labor. They, they simply think about planning uh, in kind and yeah, in small organizations where, where they can discuss this on a personal to personal basis. I like this, the way that they put it here in this paragraph. We, all, we find this ideological contradiction in the free agreement 
communism does not know this category. It only knows equal producers, equal because they have to run their businesses according to generally binding rules. Only on this basis can they make connection with other companies. The so-called free agreement contradicts any general applicable social regulation and is therefore anti-communist. So I think they're being quite strong there saying it's anti-communist, but I think you know they're trying to be as harsh as possible with the lack of these general principles. So equal producers and general binding rules, because these kind of free agreements, like you could have an agreement between uh, the miners and the car producers on one level and the miners and on say, I don't know, hospital sector on different terms. And that's not based on a kind of equal trade between between people. So that would not be equal producers. That would be something, you know, where you might have one factory, one sector dominating another. So I think this is fundamental to what we're going to do today. OK, will we take the next section? Chris, do you want to go again at this bit? B, libertarian state capitalism. The weakness of the so-called libertarian communism becomes immediately visible as soon as its representatives begin to elaborate on their fundamental principles positively. We want to prove this with the book by the famous French anarchist Sébastien Faure, Het Universal Galouk, which appeared in 1921. Um, so, sorry, uh, Chris, can you just say, uh, you might as well say what that is in English as well, the universal happiness as well. The oh, universal, okay, the universal yeah. happiness. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. And was published in Dutch by the Rode Bibliotheek in 1927. Is that the Red Library? Four uh, informs us of the purpose of his work as follows. This work describes the life of a great nation under libertarian communist rule in a simple, clear, and attractive form and is intended to show that the anarchists have a richly studied social plan. If we look at libertarian communism from the point of view of regulating production, it is not about creating equal economic conditions in which all producers control, administer, and organize production themselves, not in the least. Of course, we do not find an exact relationship between the producer and the entire social product, because the system works according to the motto, take as needed. However, this distribution system cannot be applied at the time of the takeover. In this phase, consumer goods are rationed according to a standard set for us by the masters of statistics. They allocate us how much we can use. Translated into a clear Marxist language, this means that the pr product is not available to the workers and therefore they do not have the means of production. By the way, as we will see, Ford's libertarian communism leaves no doubt about this. The regulation of operational life is understood here in the usual social democratic form in which communism is only a question of technical organization. While this summary of production in state communism is carried out by the authority of the state, in four it is created by the free and fraternal agreement. But four is against any authority. Therefore, he says, of these manifold connections in the life of the operation, this whole organization is based on the animating principle of free cooperation. Here the phrase replaces the economic reality. We are still of the opinion that an economic system is based on economic laws and not on some kind of inspiring principle. This cannot be the basis for a production and reproduction process. If the producers want to have their rights secured, with or without the animating principle, then the whole organization must be on a very material basis. Then, at least for the time being, the working time must be the measure for the share in social consumption. This seems quite clear to us. Okay, it's showing how this basically devolves into essentially the equivalent of the social democrat planning or the bolshevik planning where we are goods are rationed according to the standard set for us by the masters of statistics okay and this as we we've seen before 
means that the product is not available to the workers. It's not like I have this one-to-one -one relationship between my labor and my outcome. My income is actually being decided by somebody else, whoever the hell that is, in this initial period. And that means and essentially that the distribution, whoever controls the distribution controls the society. And if the workers aren't controlling it through their link between their labor and their product, their input of labor and their output of product, then essentially it's a case of meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And not only that, you know, we need it to be based on economic laws. I feel like I'm repeating myself here, but, you know, we need to, these to be based on economic laws, you know. So it's not like the communism of why can't we just all get along? You know, there has to be more to it than that. So who wants to read the next section? The free agreement. Alan. All right. See the free agreement. For the mutual relationship of the producers, the relationships between the different operations, we find the same fluctuating spongy ground again in the free agreement. Everything is very pleasant and cozy. People search, grope, summarize, and try out the results of the various methods. The agreement appears, offers itself, pushes itself through its results, and wins. Fare finds this basis of freedom for all by agreement among all very natural. Because, he says, isn't it the same in nature? Nature's example is there, clear and obvious. Everything is there connected by free and spontaneous agreement. The infinitely small things, a kind of dust, seek each other, attract each other, accumulate, and form a core. We must note that examples borrowed from nature are always very dangerous. And it is precisely in this particular case that it, unfortunately, shows clearly and unambiguously how completely inadequate the libertarian method is. Everything is connected by free and spontaneous agreement. It is wonderful to see how thoughtlessly the human concept of freedom is transferred to nature, but metaphorically it is necessary. But Farah completely overlooks here the decisive moment of free agreement in nature, and that is that this free agreement is determined by the mutual forces of the allies. If the sun and the earth conclude the free agreement, that the earth is to run around the sun in 365 and a quarter days, then this is determined among other things by the mass that the sun and earth have. On this basis, the free agreement is concluded. This is what nature is all about. It's atoms or electrons or whatever one takes come in mutual connection. The nature of this connection is determined by the forces which the allies have at their disposal. And therefore we would like to take the example from nature but to show that there must be an exact relationship between producer and product, and an exact relationship between the different products, if the free agreement is to be concluded in society. This agreement is then transformed from a phrase into a reality. Okay. I must say, I really liked this short section. Whenever you hear a kind of a claim to nature or a claim to common sense, you know, your, your kind of radar should be up when it comes to anything to do with like society. So that's, that's one thing, but also like th this is extremely hand wavy, like the infinite small things that kind of does seek each other, attract each other, accumulate and form a core. This stuff may sound nice and be good to read, but it shows a kind of fundamental lack of understanding about how things I think work, which they're trying to get to here in reality. Like you don't say the earth and the, the sun are come into a free agreement. It's determined by the power, you know, the forces between these different things. So we need to get our fundamental understanding of the operation at the micro level correct to get the macro phenomena that we are seeking. Anybody want to just anybody have anything to say about this elegant section, Chris? Yeah, well, it's it's just an appeal to nature argument, right? And it's something you see in a lot of with a lot of anarchists, right? They they tend to extol, you know, hunter-gatherer societies as these sort of spontaneous, free, and equal communes. And there's the idea that people, you know, generally get along as long as, you know, some uh, hierarchies don't get in the way. And But there's always some ambiguity as to how these hierarchies actually develop, which is kind of important if you want to get rid of them. You know, there's overlap with, you know, the sort of, Proudhonist free market and, you know, like even right-wing libertarians, like there's, they, they basically agree on the same principle, you know, that people would generally 
work together freely, I, I guess right libertarians just emphasize the individual more and left wingers think of it as people will spontaneously form these collectives. In either case, there's a mediating factor that isn't being addressed. Uh, the forces of the market and other Marxist uh, things that we could go on and discuss. <laughs> um, right. Marxist things. That's, that's, that's my favorite one from today, Chris. Uh, Simon. Yeah, I just want to echo what Chris was saying there. I think that's a really good point that if you don't explain, if, if you appeal to nature as the basis of your utopian program, that the question obviously would arise if the utopian commune can spontaneously emerge on the basis of the natural impulses in human beings, then um, how could this same nature give birth to capitalism and domination and exploitation and so on? I think that's, that's the contribution of historical materialism, is to show that, yes, humans are a part of nature, but it's historical nature that emerges through time and is concretely carried in the work and the language and you know, all of the uh, various alienated forms that human beings put forward uh, spontaneously. Yeah, yeah, very good. Like, uh, I've been, I had a few shows recently on kind of hunter-gatherer stuff. It's actually a kind of a, an anarchist guy I've interviewed and kind of a, a materialist anarchist, kind of critiquing the, the kind of typical anarchist, kind of David Graeber kind, well, I don't know if that's typical, but certainly he's a kind of a, kind of a superstar of the that kind of uh, the normal kind of i would think anarchist tendencies and i'm going to actually trying to get set up like a debate between some of these between the more materialist and the the more postmodern kind of anarchist anthropologists so that that might be interesting but getting towards just what you're talking about there simon let's move it on alan all righty d central state production if we now come to the organizational summary of the operational life, in order to make the apparatus usable for the needs of the people, Fare sketches a picture of which the Bolsheviks would be proud, because it is not different from the general cartel of Hilferding. The production will work for the demand, and it is therefore necessary to determine the total of the need and the quantity of each need. This is done by each municipality reporting needs by the population to the main administration office of the nation where officials get an overview of the total needs of the whole population. Then each municipality publishes a second list with the indication of how much it can produce, whereby the main administration now knows the productive forces of the nation. The solution is very clear. The top officials should now determine what part of the production falls on each community and what part of the production they can keep for themselves. This course is exactly the same as the state communists imagine it to be. Below are the masses, above are the officials who manage production and distribution. Thus, society is not grounded in economic realities, but dependent on the good or bad will or the ability of certain persons. To remove any doubt regarding the central right of disposal, he adds, the main administration knows how large the total production and the total demand is and must, therefore, inform each district committee how much product it can dispose of and how much means of production it must procure. Where the libertarian communist part of the system now lies, we completely miss it. Perhaps our readers are smarter so that they can solve the mystery for us. To simplify this solution, let us once again reprint the social democratic position of Hilferding. All decisions as to method, place, quantity, and available tools involved in the production of the new goods are made by the local, regional, or national commissars of the socialist society. With the knowledge of the requirements of their society by means of comprehensively organized statistics of production and consumption, they can thus shape with the conscious foresight the whole economic life of the communities of which they are the appointed representatives and leaders in accordance with the needs of the members. As long as our readers have not solved the mystery for us, we find that the right of disposal over the production apparatus is assigned to those who are familiar with the tricks of statistics. And perhaps we have learned so much from the political economy that it gives them power in society. This main administration must obtain the means to assert itself, i.e. it must create a state vis-a-vis -vis the workers who are animated by another principle, 
who want to establish an exact relationship from producer to product. This is one of the laws of movement in this libertarian system, whether Farah means it or not. Nor does it matter whether the dish is served with the sauce of free agreements or with the soulful principle. This does not disturb the political and economic laws. One cannot blame Farah for forging the whole economy into one. But this synthesis is a development process that the producers have to carry out themselves within the operations. Therefore, the first requirement is that there is a basis on which they can do this themselves, i.e. the introduction of the working time account as the first requirement. Then, no main administration has to assign anything anymore. Okay. There's a few good slam dunks in here. Now, one thing I think people have been kind of struggling with, uh, I think a little bit through the reading group, or, you know, getting their heads around, like, well, what's the difference between, you know, just, like, couldn't a bureaucracy plan the stuff out and share it equally? Why does it have to be, like, based on labor time accounting? Couldn't you get the same thing? I think this this sentence here, I think, is kind of a, very important. It says, thus, society is not grounded in economic realities, but dependent on the good or bad will of the ability of certain persons. Like that, if you don't have labor time accounting as your measure in your new economic system, you are dependent on the people who are in the planning place actually being good or bad people. And that's a pretty idealist way to, to go about things. You know, in reality, they'll probably have pressures and all manner of things pushing them in different ways that will probably push them away from this egalitarian basis. You know, it's, it's kind of, we would be, you would be very lucky if they, if they ended up doing things correctly. When people get power, they tend to use it. Anybody want to discuss anything in this section here? Chris? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not really familiar with Four. I, th I think it's four because there's, there's no ex ante you on the yeah. e or four uh, if you're singing. I guess like Frere uh, Jacques. Uh, <laughs> what, what I don't understand. So he he's he's arguing for this free agreement stuff, but at the same time, what is this like technocratic anarchism? Like there's these uh, statistical board that figures everything out, and then they it just. Uh, gets delivered down to the workers and then they make decisions based on that? Is, is that what's going on here? Yeah, I think so, because essentially it's not productive enough yet. So they need to figure out that everybody gets enough before you can do the free agreements. I think that's their general gist. Right. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Like if, <laughs> if, if you think about like where these things like were coming out of, I, Foray, I think, is French, but the anarchists seem to be like most dominant in Spain at this time. And Spain was like, I think, pretty undeveloped compared to like Germany and England at the time, outside yeah. of Madrid, maybe Barcelona, a few northern places. Uh, there yeah, wasn't like, much uh, industry. Like it, the anarchists tended to flourish in you know more underdeveloped European countries, or at least southern European, like Italy and uh, Spain, right? Historically, yeah. anyway, yeah. Historically, but but even like in, I think in Spain, like they they, they kind of were most popular, I think, in the south, in the very poor areas, and I think in the north. But, like, Barcelona is the richest area of, of That's Spain, true. pretty much. So I think it's a bit of a weird mix. So so in the most developed parts of the least developed <laughs> places, and it, it's, which is kind of weird. And, the, and oh. the least developed parts of the least developed yeah, parts. Yeah, yeah kind mm -hmm. of a weird bifurcation. Alan? Um, I thought it was interesting that the the basis of the criticism of anarchism or, you know, libertarian communism, anything like that, it, it's the same critique as you would apply to Bolshevism, which you would think that, you know, some kind of opposite critique would apply just superficially because like, oh, on the one hand, you know, maybe Bolshevism is too authoritarian or something. And then maybe anarchism is too chaotic. But with this, we're actually developing the same critique for both. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it is interesting, but I think like in practice, a lot of the same problems of, say, the Soviet experiment were replicated in under different kind of forms in, say, the Spanish Revolution. Like, I I remember somebody saying that like you know the idea of like the Durati column was like ended up being like a, you know nearly operating like a an executive function, a kind of a, a war council during the the revolution. That you could imagine the problems of that you get in these revolution end up even from different 
philosophical approaches sometimes end up with quite similar solutions. Kiltia? I, I was just wondering how prevalent this particular thought stream was. I mean, um, I'd not heard of libertarian anarchism, and people have mentioned it and talked about it as being libertarian communism as well. But in, just in general, there are so many different streams of anarchism. This is all very focused, and we're going to talk about anarcho-syndicalism in a minute in this chapter, but very narrowly focused on on one writer within a political philosophy philosophy that's that's laughed at for being so diverse in any case. And, and it, so it's hard to get a, really get a feel for a grip on whether you can adequately criticize it or not, just because there's so many different strands at work. Yeah, I would say that I think he's taken on the dominant strands at the time, you know, when anarchism was a was a live, you know, a really live thing, as opposed to now that has much like Marxism has like bifurcated to a crazy extent. You know, I, I do think these are our are, are major figures. We're like we're going to get into talking in the later in the chapter about like a critique of the CNT, you know, and, you know, they were the like probably the dominant force in in maybe world anarchist history. So I don't think he's kind of cherry picking. I think he's picking some of the best representatives of the dominant trends. He says here as well, I like this this final paragraph here. One cannot blame for for forging the whole economy into one, but this synthesis is a development process that the producers have to carry out themselves within the operations. Therefore, the first requirement is that there is a basis on which they can do this themselves, i.e. the introduction of working time account is the first requirement. You know, a lot of people like to, you know, shit in the anarchist or shit in the Bolsheviks and do all this. And, you know, I suppose we all do that in a bit with looking back from history. But like, I personally look at it in the way as in like, you know, these people have, if they didn't understand these things, it's given us the opportunity to understand them. So I don't blame anybody for getting, I don't blame many people for getting these things wrong. Certainly not somebody like Foray. I would think I would have a lot of different feelings for people that were in like, say, the kind of Bernsteinian wing of the SPD. I, I find myself much more akin to these anarcho-syndicalist guys. Oh, Slavic. Yeah, I would just quickly add that if people want to look at, you know, because we're mostly comparing Spanish anarchists with like the Soviet system, another good comparison might be the Black Army and the areas in Ukraine where they attempted also like an anarchist project around the same time that the Soviet system. And I think there were introductions there with some currency or something that might be worthwhile to look at too, to see if it kind of ran into the same issues. And I know that like certainly their tactical conclusions of platformism has been critiqued before as like, oh, this is just like anarchist Bolshevism or something. Obviously, they're different to some extent, but you can kind of see some of those complications there, too. Yeah, very good. OK, so I think Alan has read two sections. Anybody you want to take section E here? Anybody got a hands up? Kielce. OK. E, anarcho-syndicalism. In 1927, the Gemengd Verbond. don't know if you have a translation for that, Mixed Syndicalist Alliance. Published a brochure by Muller Lerning with the title Anarcho-Syndicalism to spread the principles of the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement as it is organized in the International Workers' Association. First, the author unmistakably criticizes the anarchists, a critique that in reality means nothing more than you are only phraseologists. The anarchists should, therefore, drop the phrases and become practical people, anarcho-syndicalists. He opposes the well-known view that it is at first a question of smashing everything to see later how things can be put right again. What is necessary is a program, how the realization of anarcho-syndicalism comes after the revolution. It is not enough just to propagate the economic revolution, but one must also examine how it must be carried out. The anarchists in Russia put the self-initiative of the masses in the foreground. But what this initiative had to be, what the masses had to do, Today and tomorrow, everything remained blurred and little positive. Many manifestos may have appeared, but few could give a clear and unambiguous answer to the question of daily practice. We may say that the Russian Revolution, once and forever, asked the question, what are the practical and economic foundations of a society without a wage system? 
what to do the day after the revolution. Anarchism will have to answer this question. It will have to learn the lesson of these last years if total failure is not to end in irreversible bankruptcy. The old anarchist slogans, however much truth they contain, and however often they are repeated, do not solve any of the problems posed by real life. In particular, they do not solve any of the problems posed by the social revolution of the working class. And Muller learning continues, without these practical realities, all propaganda remains negative and all ideals remain utopias. This is the lesson anarchism has to learn from history and it cannot be sufficiently repeated by the tragic development of the Russian Revolution. And what alternative does anarchism syndicalism propose? What are the practical foundations for a society without a wage system? Anarcho-syndicalism is just as stubbornly silent about this as anarchism. The author develops a kind of program for the construction of anarcho-syndicalist operational life, but it does not contain a single word about the economic foundations. The problem is once again considered from a social democratic point of view, from the point of view of the organizational consolidation of operational life. The Russian Revolution, in particular, has shown that the problem is not this. How do we build the operational life, whether federal or central? But the question is, which economic conditions is the operational life subject to so that the workers can control and lead the production themselves? Miller Learning then develops an organizational program. The economic organizations have the goal of expropriating the state and capitalism. The organs of state and capitalism must be replaced by the productive associations of the workers as carriers of the whole economic life. The basis must be the operation. The operating organization must form the nucleus for the new economic social organization. The whole system of production must be built on the federation of industry and agriculture. It should be noted that this refers to the construction of the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement. Workers must organize themselves into industrial and agricultural federations so that their organizations can take over operational life after the revolution. The transport company would then be run by the transport association, the mines by the miners association, and so on. In other words, the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement sees itself as the future carrier of economic life. From this point of view, there can only be a proletarian revolution if the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement is strong enough to run the factory life. This is why Muller Learning writes, the purpose of economic organizations is to expropriate the state and capitalism. Thus, the organizational extent of the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement becomes the yardstick by which maturity for the social revolution is determined. So... The general gist of all this kind of stuff is that what we're going to see is that the anarcho-syndicalists, instead of, say, the Bolsheviks putting forward, essentially, the party as the organ to determine the control of production and distribution, we are going to see the anarchists essentially end up, these anarcho-syndicalists, with the union, you know, the, 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 the great union, the CNT or whatever, as those that are going to determine production and consumption levels. So we have the same problem, but just from a, a different being being operated by a different organizational form. There's a little quote here that I like on page 95, which I think is so unbelievably pertinent for today. Without these practical realities, all propaganda remains negative and all ideals remain utopias. To me, that just describes all radical politics around today. It's still stuck in the negative 100 years later. What's brilliant about this book is that he hammers the same thing again and again and again at us. Like, so here he's saying the Russian Revolution in particular has shown that the problem is not this. It, it's not how do we build the operational life, whether federal or central. But the question is, which economic conditions is the operational life subject to so that the workers can control and lead production themselves the argument like me getting into like marx or you know radical politics myself like my introduction to it you know has nearly always been this argument between centrality and uh federalization you know a decentralized approach or a central approach to, to communism 
the actual question, the wrong question is being asked here. Anybody have anything to say on this kind of fundamental idea of federalism versus centrality? Chris? Yeah, I, I think one big problem with the federalism is that, you know, the, this sort of essentializes workers, you know, as, you know, shoe factory workers or, you know, you name it, right? It isn't about each section of the economy having independence within a federated system because, well, for one thing, most workers' jobs are arbitrary, right? They, they, they end up in these by their, their, circum, their circumstances. They're, they're not identifying with these occupations. And they, they shouldn't be run as guilds of you know, specific workers who have a relationship with this occupation. It's about workers owning all the means of production collectively and having an equal right to all of them. You know, the plumbers have just as much share in the shoe factory as the shoemakers do and vice versa, the, the shoemakers and the plumbing. Like, that's how it has to be thought of. That's, I think, something that isn't addressed or considered in the anarchist conception or anarcho-syndicalist at, at any rate. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. It does essentialize the workers. It's like, you know, I've had a lot of different jobs, God, and sometimes you'd be working with somebody and there's always one or two weirdos in your work who really kind of go, yeah, I love JavaScript program and I'm a JavaScript guy, big time, you know, and they really mold with their, their actual job, which they've randomly mostly ended up in. But like most people don't care, you know, it's just like a goddamn job. And like the idea that our relationship to the society is primarily through this idea of whatever place you've just randomly dropped into is how how your relationship to society is kind of being managed. It certainly seems not as effective as literally your relationship to the product of your output. I think that's a much more fundamental relationship. Kielce. I, I was just going to be sympathetic with the idea that these organizations, these trade unions are they, they, they're set up and they're established and they're run by the workers. So then as opposed to so many other organizations that could, could be controlling in a society. And then I can see how at the time to have an organization, organization set up and run by the workers in charge of, of the country was, uh, was attractive and I sympathize there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, to me, it seems like one of these things that could only have really been answered by the failures of history. That's the way I, I feel about it. But I feel much closer to, I, I don't know, but I, I do feel much closer in my, you know, my feelings towards, say, the narco-syndicalist approach than I do to, you know, the social democratic approach or the Bolshevik approach. I, I will say that of all the ones that we've been criticizing so far. Some people are going to call me a dirty anarchist. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been working doing fences today, so I'm definitely dirty. Whether I'm an anarchist, I'm not sure yet. I, any more comments or will we keep going? I think we'll keep going, Kielce. Do you want to take it up from where we left off, I think? In the northern countries. In the northern countries, yeah, baby. In the northern countries of Europe, where anarcho-syndicalism has no organizational significance, the workers who represent this movement feel very well that their organization cannot be a yardstick for revolution and therefore reject this consequence. But because they have no idea of the economic foundations of the communist economy, they have no ground under their feet and can do nothing but rely on the organizational control of the revolution by the trade union movement. The anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement can, therefore, best be investigated where it actually matters, and that is in Spain. Of course, it cannot be our intention here to subject the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement in Spain, the CNT, to general criticism. At this point, we are only interested in what considerations prevail here concerning the implementation of the communist economy. There does not seem to be the slightest doubt about that the CNT as a trade union demands the management and administration of economic life for itself. This can be seen, for example, from the fact that it demands the union's control over production, De Syndicalist, 19th of September, 1931, and not the control of the broad masses by their councils. Even the course of the CNT Congress in June 1931 leaves no room for doubt in this respect. In the French syndicalist magazine, La Revolution Proletarienne of July 1931, there is a report about this Congress from which we take, the Congress shows that the CNT is an enormous force. The only thing that remains is to specify and put into practice its measures for the takeover of industry. 
You can see that the CNT must carry out the seizure. That's why Muller Lenin wrote, the economic organizations have as their goal the expropriation of the state and capitalism. And the French report on the CNT Congress also states, the Congress has decided to demand the expropriation of all domains over 50 hectares by handing over land, livestock, and equipment to the farm workers' unions. And to clear up misunderstandings about the socialization plans of the anarcho-syndicalist trade union movement, the syndicalists reported on August 29, 1931, there are several militants in the National Committee of the CNT who do not believe that the CNT in its present condition is ready to take over production. What a misunderstanding about the fundamental problems of the social revolution. Why does anarcho-syndicalism refuse to cast a glance into the mysterious veil that lies over the traffic of products between operations in the communist economy? On what economic basis does consumption take place? What is the economic basis of the producer in relation to the social wealth of goods? We hear nothing about it. That is a bad sign, but that means nothing other than referring here to the economic foundations of the libertarian communism of the French anarchist Faure. There is no other way. Therefore, as an economic critique of anarcho-syndicalism, we are applying exactly what we have already written about Faure. The economic critique of Faure's libertarian communism is also the critique of anarcho-syndicalism. Okay. Yeah, so here, here he's going to spell out the criticism here of the CNT. There does not seem to be the slightest doubt that the CNT, is a, as a trade union, demands the management and administration of economic life for itself. So, you know, we have different wings of the radical movements. We've got the anarcho-syndicalists saying, yeah, 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 unions, they should rule the, the roost. And then we have you know, kind of uh, the social democrats or the Bolshevik wing going party, 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 the party should do should rule stuff. And we've seen this kind of essentialization of a different organizational form without without a focus on the political on a correct focus on the political economy. And he goes on here to generally critique anarchists. And I think this is something that probably is still reasonably fair critique today, which is like this question here. So this is in response to saying that the CNT do not believe they're ready, they're big enough yet maybe to to take over, some militants in it, take over production, that it's a problem with the CNT as opposed to a, an understanding of what needs to be done economically, the social economic relations at the root. What a misunderstanding about the fundamental problems of the social revolution. Why does anarcho-syndicalism refuse to cast a glance under the mysterious veil that lies over the traffic of products between operations in the communist economy. You know, and I think I consider myself like some kind of Marxist. Yeah. And I think most of these kind of Marxists are much more in today, just run the mill Marxists interested in political economy, I think, than anarchists show themselves to be. And I think I, I wonder how much of that lies in the fact that Marx was the kind of person people turn to political economy. Marx as a, a figurehead is kind of diametrically usually juxtaposed with respect to kind of the typical understanding of an anarchism that Marx got to represent like the Bolsheviks and the anarchists uh, oppose that whole view. Now, I don't know. I don't know. There's something in anarchism today that doesn't focus on the political economy. And it seems to I don't think I, I think it's too rough to say that it, it was the same then. Am I waffling here? What do people think about that? I'm definitely waffling. What do people think about it, Chris? Yeah, I think there's something to that. Like they're, they're, it's very focused on, um, and and rightly so, on you know moral indignation against injustices in the world, not always with teasing out why they're happening or, or what's fueling them. And, and to go back to the free agreement stuff, I, I can think of what what Marx would say to that. He'd just say, "Yeah, well, you know, that's capitalism. <laughs> Look at Volume One. That's." That's what wage slavery is all about, right? That, that's the veil that is uh, placed over it, where the, the, the worker perceives himself as, you know, s selling their labor power as a commodity. And it's this sort of formal freedoms. I, I don't see that being um, addressed or necessarily eliminated other than by, you know, having unions owning everything, apparently. I think that's a very good insight. I think Marx would say, like, Marx does go into the whole idea of, you know, selling your labor power as, a, as if you're, you're free to sell your labor power. I think you, unless you deal with, you know, 
these problems of the wage system, you're going to end up with similar value form stuff poking its head out. Simon? Yeah, I was just thinking about the distinction you were drawing out between contemporary Marxists and contemporary anarchists. I was just thinking that a lot of that boils down to pre-existing cultural proclivities of the, of the people before they become politically engaged. In a sense that I think that people who are more of a kind of a quantitative scientific bent would tend to gravitate more towards the uh, complexity. Is this, is this nerds? Are you, are you saying we're all nerds? Is that it, Simon? Yeah, nerds on one hand and then kind of artsy, artsy people on the other hand. People who are drawn more to, you know, a, a kind of a, a fundamental transformation in the quality of human relationships and who, who see, you know, present day society is basically human submitting themselves to these impersonal machines. And uh, if we get into, if we get into the details of, you know, things like political economy, there's just this kind of visceral reaction on the part of certain anarchists in the sense that you're trying to build another machine to replace the machine that just needs to be smashed so that human beings can relate to each other on a less alienated basis, uh, on the basis of common humanity. And it's, it's, a, it's an expression of other cultural divisions, I think. That makes sense, certainly for my, you know, I'm a kind of a maths and nerdy dude, you know, I got read Marx and fell down that whole you know so i can certainly yeah i certainly see there's definitely a, a big element of that going on for myself 100 percent. i'm just gonna say that personally i'm i'm i feel like a bit of an interloper here i'm i'm more from the i'm from a kind of philosophical background myself and kind of did a lot of you know post wittgensteinian heideggerian deconstructionist shite and and i and i really feel that what what has been lacking in my education for the last forty years is more of that nerdy empirical and quantitative stuff. So yeah, I'm I'm here to be nerdified, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a synthesis. We need we need ultimate synthesis. That's what we're after. Well, I think what's kind of fascinating about the critique is, you know, like what somebody was saying there earlier is that I don't think it's fair to say that there was a lack of focus by the social democrats in germany on the political economy maybe there was a bit but they certainly had some uh, i think it seems like more so than the anarchists i think like if you read what the bolsheviks talk about the bolsheviks seem to have had lenin and and, and these lot had a, a quite a, a negative relationship to capitalism you know like socialism it was capitalism in the negative as opposed to a a, a positive scientific approach too. And I think this overall lack of a understanding of the political economy has led these different kind of wings of the radical left down into the same sinkhole, you know, and that's kind of a very fundamental, you know, historical materialist finding, I think, that really makes it very, very important for people to refocus, to take the focus away from the centralism versus the federalism or consensus versus simple democratic rule you know these kind of debates that we hear endlessly going on and on and on and back to the root fundamental economic relations which we are going to hit next week today is kind of a short one anybody have any final wrap-up things they want to say about this chapter chris one thing the social democrats and anarchists might have in common is the foundation of their respective utopias will be the uh, trust fund, which uh, that, that, that's just my little sarcastic quip for the day. The trust fund, the dreaded trust fund. Oh, yes. Nathan Robinson style trust fund. I love it. But sure, Marx had a trust fund himself. He essentially had Engels trust fund, didn't he? Yeah, but he also gave away his inheritance to buy guns for Belgian workers. So you got to give him credit there. Engels did, did he? No, no, Marx did. Okay, but that was probably wasn't too much. <laughs> yeah, well, pro pro probably not. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so next week we're going to do chapter six is very short. It's only three pages. And chapter seven, we're finally getting into the, I think in chapter seven are fundamental equations. So from here, we're going to get into 
we're out of critique and we're into positive description of the economic laws. So hopefully in the next couple of chapters, we're going to really get into the questions people, I think, will really have about the day-to-day -day operational implications for what is here. So I think these chapters initially, they might go quite slowly as we start dealing with all these issues about how planning regulates, how guilds operate, how accumulation operates. But I suppose accumulation is not for a while, not for a few chapters. But we're going to get into some of these results. So it, end up, it might slow down, but maybe people are getting their heads around the stuff a bit more. So hopefully we'll try and go all the way from page 101 to 123. Now, I don't imagine we'll get through it all, but we'll read it all. And then we'll see if we everybody can read that for next week. And I'm sure I'll talk to you the same back channel, same time, same back channel. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.